Hi everyone, my name is Ima Ramos and I'm the curator of the Medieval to Modern South Asia collections at the British Museum and the curator of the Tantra Enlightenment to Revolution exhibition. The show aims to explore the real meaning of Tantra. The overwhelming image of Tantra as a cult of ecstasy in the West has persisted since the 19th century. The erotic does play a role in Tantra, but not in the way people might think. It's only one strand of this very rich philosophical tradition. The show will aim to explore all of its complexity. Originating in 6th century India, Tantra is a philosophy that has been linked to successive waves of revolutionary thought from its early medieval transformation of Hinduism and Buddhism to the Indian fight for independence and the rise of 1960s counterculture in the West. Centering on the power of divine feminine energy, Tantra inspired the dramatic rise of goddess worship in medieval India and continues to influence contemporary feminist thought and artistic practice. Tantra is rooted in sacred instructional texts called Tantras. They take their name from the Sanskrit word tan, meaning to weave or compose, and are often written in the form of a conversation between a god and goddess. We open the exhibition with some of the earliest surviving Tantras in the world on loan from Cambridge University Library. These manuscripts outline a variety of rituals for invoking one of the many all-powerful tantric deities. The tantras also describe rituals that transgressed existing social and religious boundaries, such as sexual rights and engagement with intoxicants and the taboo. These rituals affirmed all aspects of existence as sacred, including the body and the sensual, in order to achieve liberation and generate power. From its inception to the present day, Tantra has challenged religious, cultural and political conventions and opened up new ways of seeing and changing the world. The exhibition will take visitors on a journey from the roots of Tantra in India to its rise and spread across Asia and beyond. But today I wanted to hone in on how tantric ideas and imagery inspired global countercultural movements during the 1960s and 70s in India, Britain and the United States. Before and after Indian independence from British rule in 1947 and the emergence of India and Pakistan as independent nation states, South Asian artists forged modern national styles rooted in the pre-colonial art of the past. In the 1970s, South Asian artists associated with the Neo-Tantra movement from Kashmir, Bangladesh, Pakistan and India adopted tantric symbols and adapted them to speak to the visual language of global modernism. They were inspired by the Delhi-based writer Ajit Mukherjee, who owned a vast collection of tantric sculptures and paintings, which he published in his book Tantra Art, Its Philosophy and Physics in 1966. He emphasised their philosophical content and sought to reclaim Tantra from its colonial era association with hedonism and black magic. Ghulam Rasul Santosh, a leading artist associated with the Neo-Tantra movement, was born in Kashmir to a Shia Muslim family. Santosh took inspiration from Mukherjee's collection and writings. Mukherjee had argued that, quote, the idea that masculinity and femininity are two different factors is as illusory as the duality of body and soul. In this painting by Santosh, Limbs emerge from an oval, egg-like shape to suggest a genderless figure seated in a cross-legged yoga pose known as the lotus posture. The head is replaced by an orange trident, the emblem of Shiva, one of the most important deities within tantric philosophy and practice. 
The image draws on depictions of yogis like this 19th century courtly painting from Rajasthan. Here we see an illustration of the goal of tantric yoga, which is to awaken an individual's inner source of power, located at the base of the spine and visualized as the serpent goddess Kundalini. Through breath control and complex postures, Kundalini rises up the body, coming into contact with chakras or energy centers. At the crown of the head resides Shiva, embodying pure consciousness. They unite, triggering an awakened, liberated state. Santosh himself practiced yoga and he became deeply influenced by tantric philosophy after visiting a Shiva shrine in the Kashmir Himalayas in 1964. Here, his features are abstracted into rhythmic blue lines, evoking a description of enlightenment as a luminous sea of subsiding waves by the 10th century Kashmiri tantric master Abhinava Gupta. The mysterious emptiness of his eye sockets suggests he is in a meditative state as he becomes one with his surroundings. Santosh once said that Tantra for me was an internal urge, a call to understand the truth that is the source and underlying principle of everything. Born in present-day Bangladesh, Biran Day was inspired by the concentric shapes of mandalas, which play a major role in tantric ritual and practice. Mandalas frame luminous central deities. This center point, or bindu, is an expression of cosmic creation. A mandala is a circular diagram showing deities and their celestial surroundings. Geometric forms capture their essence. Originating in India, mandalas are conceived as sacred ritual spaces designed to invoke deities before an important ritual such as tantric initiation. In this 16th century Tibetan example, we see four mandalas, each featuring tantric deities at the centre. During visualisation, a practitioner imagines entering a mandala as though it were a palace, crossing over its outer band and entering through one of the four doors, representing the cardinal directions. Each door is protected by guardian deities. The practitioner continues until they encounter the central deity with whom they seek to identify, ultimately merging with them and taking their place at the center of the mandala. Birande used color to suggest light and energy flowing from the center of his own paintings. He was reluctant to be typecast as a neo-tantra artist, but acknowledged the impact of tantric philosophy on his work. To quote him here, by making us acknowledge the fragmented state of our existence, Tantra encourages us to strive to transcend these barriers. Mahirwan Mamtani was also influenced by the writings of Ajit Mukherjee, who argued that the tantric idea of everything being infused with Shakti, or divine feminine power, reflected discoveries in quantum physics, such as the concept that all matter is energy. Mamtani, who was born in Pakistan, used the symbol of the Bindu, an expression of cosmic creation, to reflect this idea. As he put it, Centrovision is based on an impulse to transform my experience of the world into a vision leading to the Bindu, resulting in a unity, wholeness, or merging with the universal consciousness of self. He was influenced by the shapes of mandalas and also yantras, which are ritual diagrams. Yantras are used to invoke deities during tantric practice and in rites designed to fulfill spiritual and worldly ambitions. At the top of this yantra, the tantric goddess Vajrayogini dances within an upside down triangle, a symbol of the yoni or vulva and creative power. Vajrayogini is positioned at the highest point, 
representing the cosmic center from which all things constantly arise and dissolve. A painting by Prafula Mohanty, who was born in Odisha in eastern India, also based on the concept of cosmic energy flowing from the Bindu, invokes the tantric goddess Kali at its fiery center. It's typical of the artist's work, made up of concentric oval shapes in different shades, the rims bleeding outwards. Kali remains one of the most popular tantric goddesses, especially in eastern India. She's shown here at the centre of a yantra, a ritual diagram used to invoke her. There are five downward triangles representing the yoni within an eight-petaled lotus, the central point evoking Kali herself. From the late 1950s, Western interest in Indian culture and Tantra grew in tandem with a shared American-British countercultural revolution against conservative social, political and religious establishments. The next two decades saw the rise of sexual freedom, environmentalism, anti-capitalism, feminism, the Black Power movement, anti-imperialist sentiment, and protests against the American military involvement in Vietnam. Against this backdrop, and as a result of an increasingly shrinking global village connected by travel and technology, Tantra offered an alternative, affirmative worldview for young Westerners that, to quote British philosopher Alan Watts, served as a marvellous and welcome corrective to certain excesses of Western civilization. In 1968, Ajit Mukherjee collaborated with director Nick Douglas to make an experimental art film, Tantra, Indian Rites of Ecstasy. The film was impressionistic and, in the words of Douglas, attempted to plunge the viewer without explanation into the sounds and visual splendour of Tantra art and ritual. It featured a collage of scenes and images, including details of Tantric sculptures and paintings along with shots of worship and ritual. In the introductory section of the exhibition, we wanted to include a modern response to Tantra, so we'll be showing extracts from this film as visitors enter the space. In 1969, Mick Jagger, who was one of the film's producers, approached the designer John Pash and asked him to create a logo for the Rolling Stones record label, inspired by the goddess Kali. His design focused on the goddess's protruding tongue, a feature that originally suggested her ravenous appetite on the battlefield. In the exhibition, visitors will see dramatic images of Kali wearing garlands of decapitated heads, which represent the ego. Her mouth is smeared with blood as though thirsting for more. She carries a sword of wisdom in one of her hands, with which she destroys obstacles to enlightenment. Although she appears fierce, she also conveys compassion and a desire to assist followers on their spiritual path. During the 19th century, when this print was published, Indian revolutionaries in Bengal also reimagined Kali as a symbol of an independent India rising up against the British, which inspired anti-colonial activity. The Rolling Stones logo conveyed the band's rebellious, anti-establishment spirit, as well as Jagger's own voluptuous mouth. It was first reproduced on the inner sleeve of the band's Sticky Fingers album in 1971 and became one of the most iconic symbols of the rock era. The first major exhibition of tantric material culture in the West was held in the same year at the Hayward Gallery in London which generated further international interest in the subject. Mukherjee's collection formed the backbone of the exhibition. The poster for the show featured a close-up of a 17th century Nepalese scroll painting of the yogic body. Below the title for the show was the tantalising description of an exhibition exploring the Indian cult of ecstasy, reflecting a particular reading of Tantra as a so-called cult that could challenge and overcome stifled attitudes to sexuality in the West. 
Tantric imagery inspired British artists such as Nigel Weymouth and Michael English, who worked under the name Hapshash and the Coloured Coat to produce psychedelic posters communicating ecological and free love ideals. By the 60s, Tantra was associated with social, political, as well as spiritual liberation. This pull-out poster is based on Tantric Buddhist images of a god and goddess in union. These images historically use gender to articulate the two qualities to be cultivated on the path towards spiritual enlightenment, wisdom and compassion. These are visualised as a goddess representing wisdom and a god representing compassion in sexual union as we see with this Tibetan painting. In Tibet this is known as Yabyum or father mother. The goal is to internalise these qualities by visualising the deities uniting within the body through meditation. In the West, many people assumed that erotic tantric images reflected a liberal approach to sex based on pleasure rather than, or as well as, a means of attaining enlightenment. The Hapshash poster captured the sexual revolutionary spirit of the decade. This poster, also designed by Weymouth in English, reflects their engagement with the environmental movement and was created as a reaction against the industrial damage inflicted on the planet's ecosystem by unregulated corporations. Inspired by mandala imagery, a four-armed, weapon-wielding deity sits cross-legged at the centre. He resembles Manjushri, a tantric Buddhist deity who wields a flaming wisdom sword to annihilate ignorance. But this hapshash ecological deity is also an interfaith one. He carries a Wiccan pentacle and chalice, while the star and crescent around his neck is a symbol associated with Islam. Around the god are two rings, one made up of naked men and women dancing and embracing, and another evoking a paradise on earth with flowering trees, sea and mountains in the distance. The tantric conception of the world as a manifestation of divine feminine power was a source of inspiration for this poster. The image was designed in 1967, a year before the iconic photograph of the Earth was taken from lunar orbit, later described as the most influential environmental photograph ever taken, capturing the fragility of the life-supporting planet. In the United States, a parallel utopian optimism was taking hold of the younger generation. This poster became one of the most iconic of the 60s, designed by Stanley Mouse and Alton Kelly. It advertises the gathering of the tribes for a human being festival held in San Francisco. It promoted communal living, ecological awareness and the use of psychedelic drugs to induce altered states of consciousness. Yoga and meditation were promoted as practices that could inspire revolutionary minds to challenge the status quo and question capitalist structures. The bottom of the poster reads, bring food to share, bring flowers, beads, costumes, feathers, symbols, flags, encapsulating the spirit of the hippie movement. The portrait taken in Nepal shows how yogis captured the popular imagination in the West as countercultural role models. From the 60s, American jazz music drew on global sources. The decolonization of territories across Africa and Asia in the second half of the 20th century, along with the rise of the Black Power movement, fostered new non-Western and transnational forms of black spirituality. The jazz trumpeter Don Cherry was inspired by tantric traditions and studied under the Indian musician and mystic Pran Nath. In 1976, he recorded the album Here and Now, which featured the opening track Mahakali or Great Kali. It begins with Tibetan bells and continues with a trumpet sitar dialogue before erupting into a hailstorm of electric guitar chords and drum beats 
as if to signal the goddess Kali's dramatic arrival. On the cover of the album, Cherry is portrayed as a modern-day yogi seated in the lotus pose with a Buddhist deity above him. He wears a necklace of mala beads used to keep count while reciting mantras. Mantras are Sanskrit syllables embodying the nature of a deity. They play a fundamental role as power words in tantric practice and are passed from guru to disciple. Tantra influenced beat generation poets such as Lenore Kandel. She achieved notoriety in 1966 when she published this collection of poems entitled The Love Book. I'll read you one of the less explicit lines. United in love scream, sacred our acts and our actions, sacred our parts and our persons. Her use of transgressive language played on the often explicit sexual references found in tantric texts. Some describe sexual rights for achieving enlightenment. These can be understood both literally and symbolically. If taken literally, a couple assumes the role of deities in sexual union, the woman often being the focus of worship. When interpreted symbolically, a practitioner visualizes this union within their own body, the deities symbolizing qualities such as wisdom and compassion. The Tantra pictured here recommends the union of the thunderbolt and lotus, which can be understood as the phallus and vulva. This folio from a tantric manuscript describes the benefits of engaging in sexual rites in order to elevate and transcend desire itself. On the folio are the words, by passion the world is bound, by passion too it is released. Sexual rights should not be taught for the sake of enjoyment, but for the examination of one's own thought, whether the mind is steady or wavering. Even celibate monks and nuns could engage with this method by internalizing deities in union through visualization. Kandel was familiar with the notion that tantric practitioners who engaged in sexual rites visualize themselves as embodiments of deities representing qualities such as wisdom and compassion. The front cover of the book featured images of tantric yabyum deities in union. The governor of California at the time, Ronald Reagan, attempted to ban the book, calling it pornographic, which led to the longest trial in San Francisco's history. During the hearing, Kandel defended the poems as holy erotica, but the jury ultimately supported the obscenity charge, which would not be overturned until 1974. In the West during the 60s and 70s, which coincided with the rise of the second wave feminist movement, many women like Kandel were drawn to tantric goddesses as powerful agents with the capacity to destroy who were often portrayed in sexually dominant positions, appearing to confront patriarchal constructions of the ideal woman as passive and obedient. This is demonstrated in the exhibition through many historical representations of goddesses as well as female tantric masters. These include a 9th century temple relief from Madhya Pradesh depicting the ferocious goddess Chamunda, a 13th century devotional bronze of a fearless female poet saint from Tamil Nadu, a Tibetan painting showing a renowned 11th century tantric guru, and a 19th century popular print of the self-decapitating goddess Chinamasta, who communicates the inseparability and interdependence of sex, life and death at the heart of human experience. Uninhibited, creative expressions of female sexuality and pleasure through a tantric lens were explored by the British artist Penny Slinger, in 1971, she visited the Tantra exhibition at the Hayward Gallery. Inspired by paintings of the yogic body with chakras, she created her own versions using her body to produce provocative scrolls with a photocopying machine. Challenging ideas of the body as shameful, as she put it, 
Slingham was drawn to Tantra as a, quote, path of the goddess, uniting the physical with the spiritual. In this example on the left, roses mark her chakras, while images of the goddess Vajrayogini dance over her body. Photocopying her body allowed Slinger to compose her work from slices of my being, as she described it. She sticks out her tongue in imitation of the goddess Kali, harnessing her unrestrained force. Slinger was influenced by Tantra's emphasis on Shakti as feminine power infusing all phenomena, which could be tapped into as an agent of bodily and psychological transformation. Another method for emancipating the repressed West lay in the use of intoxicants as a means to induce expanded states of consciousness. Hallucinogenic substances such as cannabis and LSD were thought to have quasi-religious properties that could enable consciousness-expanding instant nirvana as described by the American psychologist Timothy Leary who associated its effects with tantric experience. This is Leary addressing the crowd at the Human Being Festival mentioned earlier. Some of you might be familiar with his well-known mantra-like phrase, turn on, tune in, drop out, which encouraged revolt against conformity. The properties of LSD were known to heighten the senses and to induce vivid hallucinations inspiring a wave of psychedelia-inspired artworks, including those by Hapshash and the Coloured Coat. Leary co-authored this book, The Psychedelic Experience, in 1964, which took inspiration from the Tibetan Book of the Dead, attributed to the 8th century tantric master Padmasambhava. The Tibetan Book of the Dead describes the hallucinatory stages experienced by the mind after death, in the intermediary realm of the bardo, during which visionary forms appear before the individual is reborn. This Nepalese painting features wrathful tantric deities associated with the bardo. Leary saw these bardo stages as mirroring the experiences of taking LSD, which was made illegal in the US in 1967, from the psychological death of the ego, as he described it, to rebirth. Aldous Huxley, who famously coined the term psychedelic, which literally means mind manifesting, had written the first psychedelic Bible of the era, The Doors of Perception, in 1954, which outlined his experience of taking mescaline. He had introduced Leary to Tantra in a letter dating to 1962, which I'll read from now. Tantra teaches a yoga of sex, a yoga of eating, even eating forbidden foods and drinking forbidden drinks. The sacramentalizing of common life so that every event may become a means whereby enlightenment can be realized. LSD and the mushroom should be used, it seems to me, in the context of this basic tantric idea of the yoga of total awareness leading to enlightenment within the world of everyday experience, which of course becomes the world of miracle and beauty and divine mystery when experience is what it always ought to be. Huxley's perceptive interpretation of Tantra as the sacramentalizing of common life and enlightenment within the world of everyday experience recognized the role of transgression in rituals that engaged with taboo elements. Huxley understood that these rituals were designed to challenge distinctions between purity and impurity, transforming the forbidden into a divine instrument. Both Huxley and Leary believed Tantra could teach Western society how to unlearn oppressive and moralistic middle-class principles. A fun fact about Leary's psychedelic experience is that there's a line in the book that goes, turn off your mind, relax, float downstream, which was made famous by the Beatles in their song Tomorrow Never Knows, which many of you will be familiar with. 
The Beatles travelled to Rishikesh in India in 1968 to stay in the ashram of the Guru Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, who was the founder of the Transcendental Meditation Movement. Their visit led to a rapid increase in young people's interest in the subcontinent and its spiritual traditions. Throughout the 60s and 70s, Europeans and Americans travelled on the overland hippie trail to Kathmandu in Nepal. Before 1973, cannabis was sold legally there, and one of the most well-known businesses was the Eden Hashish Centre, run by D.D. Sharma. Posters advertising the centre to tourists featured images of Hindu deities, including this 60s example depicting Shiva. The centre's slogan, Let Us Take Higher, appears below the image, inviting people to come visit us anytime for all your hashish needs. Here, Sharma shrewdly sells the idea of the drug's transcendental properties and its associations with the unruly tantric god Shiva to the influx of hippies eager for a spiritual high. Shiva's divine madness was understood as an intoxication from bung, which is an edible preparation created from the leaves and flowers of the cannabis plant. In this 18th century drawing, his wife Parvati pours him a cup of bung as he woozily leans back. The consumption of cannabis among yogis was a popular subject in courtly Indian painting. In the bottom corner of this painting, some pound, knead and scoop the cannabis leaves, boiling them in water or milk and straining them to produce the liquid. This was consumed to achieve transcendent states in imitation of Shiva. In 1973, the Nepalese government outlawed cannabis under pressure from President Nixon's US administration, which feared that Kathmandu was becoming a centre for youth radicalism. One traveller who found his way to India in the early 70s was the Japanese artist Yoko Tadanori, who went on to create designs reimagining tantric concepts and images fused with the aesthetics of psychedelia popularised in the West. These prints evoke his fascination with the mythical kingdom of Shambhala, which according to legend was located north of the Himalayas and inhabited by tantric masters. In one print, a rainbow streams from the head of a meditating yogi, portraying mind and body as a source of light. It draws on images like this one from the British Library, illustrating the yogic body as a sacred instrument according to tantric conceptions of corporeality. Another print by Yoko includes a courtly couple performing sexual intercourse. This image is most likely adapted from a Rajput painting similar to this 17th century example from Rajasthan that forms part of a series illustrating sexual positions. Such images were influenced by ancient texts dedicated to karma, which means pleasure or desire, such as the Karma Sutra, which was written around the 3rd century. According to this text, sexual pleasure for those living at court should be a cultivated art. Contrary to Western misperceptions, Tantra had little to do with the science of pleasure outlined in the Karma Sutra. Here, Yoko's figures draw on the visual vocabulary that both the Karma Sutra and Tantra inspired, secular and sacred respectively, in order to suggest that Shambhala is a land free of sexual constraints. Yoko sought to look within himself to access Shambhala as a state of mind through yoga and meditation. As he put it, Shambhala is the centre of cosmic consciousness, which can lead us human beings spiritually. If each individual could reach this internal state, then a broader social revolution would make Shambhala a reality. Tantra lay at the heart of the shared countercultural movements of the 60s and 70s. 
In Britain and the US, this resulted in the reinterpretation of many of its characteristics in the service of progressive thought, to resist capitalist culture and authoritarianism, to embolden collective action, and to facilitate consciousness-expanding worldviews. Such readings of Tantra could also inevitably often lead to reductive interpretations of its teachings, as well as forms of cultural appropriation. The galvanising of Tantric and South Asian traditions to promote a utopian vision had by the 80s lost much of its political bite with the rise of market-oriented neoliberal policies in the West. More recently, Tantra, yoga and mindfulness have become big business at the service of the individual, even used by large corporations to encourage productivity in their workforce. Nevertheless, the rebellious spirit of Tantra, with its potential to disrupt prevailing social, cultural and political establishments, remains ripe for the reimagining. Mm -hmm.